Tim Hanford tonight here, talking about a new book. In particular, the subject of the topic tonight will be how to solve uh, problems in complex environments in this current world. And Tim is a very regular contributor to the Financial Times. He writes two regular columns. He has written numerous books, and among the most famous and well published of these is The Undercover Economist. But tonight we are here about to know more about the most recent book, which is called Adapt, and that tries to explain, in particular, how do we go upon solving difficult problems in a world that is ever more complex. And the case will be made, or at least that's my take on the book, that uh, we should go further into trial and error when the world becomes complex, that failure when we experiment is a necessary part of this process, but that it is the only way to achieve answers in such a complicated world. I could stay here very long talking about Tim's accomplishments <laughs> in his short lifespan, but I think you have not to hear from me, but to hear from Tim. So I will, with no further ado, let him talk for an hour, and then we will take questions from the audience concerning the presentation. So. Francesca very kindly left, left the book here. I want to wave it around. Yeah, if I forget what it looks like. Thank you very much. Um, that's not my first slide. That's better. Okay. Uh, about 10 years ago, the uh, cutting edge, intellectual, uh, avant garde American choreographer, Twyla Farr, decided that she was going to try something completely new. She, she worked with everybody. She worked with Marsh Foreman, the, the director of Amadeus. She worked with uh, Mikhail Baryshnikov. She worked with Philip Glass, the minimalist composer. And she decided she was going to create a show that was part ballet and uh, part modern dance and part musical and part rock concert. And it was going to be based on the songs of Billy Joel. Uh, you know, uh, Piano Man and Uptown Girl, like, you're all too young. <laughs> Check it out on YouTube, it's great. Um, and she, she called Billy Joel and he said, yeah, that's fine. In fact, he, he actually later said, if you get in Twyla Tharp's way, you die. So he was very clear on who had creative control of this uh, project. And so she, she went about setting up the show, recruiting the dancers, the band, uh, getting an arranger, writing the story around which all of these songs uh, would, would fit, and of course, most importantly, choreographing the show. And in the summer of 2002, the show, Move It Out, premiered on the stage of the Schubert Theatre in Chicago. And it was terrible. <laughs> really, really bad. So one reviewer said it was pile-driving and almost embarrassingly naive. Uh, another said um, there are scenes that are at least as silly as anything in Grief and Madness. Uh, another said it was crazily uneven. Another said there's this one scene where half the audience turns to the other half of the audience and say, what just happened? <laughs> Who just died? Huh? Now, ordinarily, that, that would only be incredibly humiliating. Um, but it was worse on, on this occasion. But normally, when a show uh, premieres in Chicago, or sometimes Philadelphia, uh, sometimes Boston, it's, it's going to appear on Broadway in about three months. And the idea is to just fix those tiny, tiny little niggles, those last few errors, um, and get it all ironed out before it appears on New York stage. And there's a, a sort of an informal agreement, which is that what happens in Chicago stays in Chicago. The Chicago reviews are not published in New York. Uh, the New York press don't go there. Um, but in this case, Happily John's really famous. And the show is really bad. <laughs> and the reviews are really fun to read. 
So the New York press just can't quite contain themselves, and they start reprinting the Chicago reviews. There's one particularly um, juicy review uh, that is reprinted in the New York uh, newspaper Newsday. So now, everyone in New York, in particular, every theatre critic in New York, knows that this gigantic turkey is about to flap its way down to Chicago. We'll, we'll talk more about Tyler Fart later. Uh, what I want to argue this evening is that all of us, if we actually want to do interesting things, to make a difference to the world, to solve serious and important problems, um, to lead interesting lives, uh, whether we're uh, interested in policy, whether we're interested in business, whether we're interested in environmental problems, even military problems, all of us need to put ourselves more in the situation that Twyla Tharp found herself in. We need to risk that incredibly embarrassing, career-destroying public humiliation. Now, I realise this possibly is a hard sell, so <laughs> let, me try and, let me try and build the argument. And exhibit A in my argument is, hopefully, ah, uh, yeah, the slides work, even better. Of course, if the slides don't work, even though I'm making a talk about why we should all make mistakes, uh, if the slides don't work, it's fine. But yes, this is Exhibit A. Uh, can anybody tell me what this is? It's a toaster, yeah. It's a very special toaster. It's the cheapest toaster it's possible to buy from Argos. It costs £3.96. You can have this toaster for one hour's badly paid work. Now, uh, the toaster is, I think, a very beautiful object, I'm sure you'll agree, and it makes toast, which makes it all the more beautiful. The toaster is interesting because this toaster was the inspiration for a very interesting project uh, conceived of by a design student in London about four years ago, four or five years ago. And his name was Thomas Twites. And his idea was uh, the toaster project. What he was going to do was build a toaster from scratch. So what you've got to imagine is a design student clad only in his underpants with a screwdriver and he's going to make a toaster. I realise it's possibly difficult to imagine this. Possibly some of you have imagined it and are now finding it difficult to stop. <laughs> that's, the, that's the vision, okay? Underpants, screwdriver, toaster. So the first thing Thomas did was to buy this toaster from Argos, £3.96, and take it apart. And he discovered that toaster is a surprisingly complicated thing when you look at it. There are over 400 components and subcomponents in your bottom of the range toaster. And there are all sorts of different uh, materials. So there is there's mica, which is a slate-like mineral you wrap uh, the toaster heating element around. Uh, there's copper, there's nickel, there's iron, there's plastic. Plastic's really important. Uh, without plastic, you don't get the beautiful, sleek toaster casing. Also, you get electrocuted. <laughs> And you might think that taking the toaster apart and looking at these 400 components would be intimidating, but um, Thomas is not easily intimidated, and he decided he'd better just get on with it, better just acquire some of these commodities. So he began uh, by looking for iron. And it turns out Britain's a post-industrial society. We, you know, we, we make merchant ivory movies and, and sort of bad financial products. But we don't, don't really do much of the old iron mining anymore. But Thomas Waits did find a museum of iron mining in an old iron mine. And he called them up and he said, hey, I'm a design student. I tried to make a toaster. <laughs> Come down. And they said, yeah, sure. Uh, when he got there, he realized they had, there had been um, a misunderstanding. They, they thought that he had said, I'm a design student and I'm trying to make a poster. <laughs> Actually, when you think about it, it really makes a lot more sense. <laughs> but anyway, that misunderstanding was smoothed out, and uh, they gave Thomas a suitcase full of iron ore. And of course, if you have a suitcase full of iron ore, you can take it back to London, and you can get down to the business of smelting it. So to smelt it, what you need is a dustbin, you fill it with barbecue coals and iron ore, and through the back, 
you punch a leaf blower. Now, back in the day, we had this big old medieval leather bellows, and you sort of pump the, the air over the barbecue coals, you know, the oxygen, get everything nice and hot. Um, but this is the 21st century, so Thomas just used the leaf blower, it goes, whoo, switch on, you're fine. The air flow's going in there, the coals getting nice and hot. Now, I would say, um, don't try this at home. <laughs> Uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One is it, it, it's really dangerous. The other is it doesn't work. <laughs> but Thomas was undaunted. He then discovered a recently patented method of smelting iron in a microwave. <laughs> I think all you need to know about this is a picture of the second microwave. <laughs> You might be thinking at this stage, well, hang on, what about the original dream? You know, the underpants, the screwdriver. This guy is using more complex, more expensive, more modern technology to make the toaster than the toaster itself. A leaf blower is more expensive than a toaster. A microwave is more expensive than a toaster. Well, I confronted him with this accusation. And he said, well, I realized, Tim, it's really just me naked in a forest somewhere. I could spend my entire life, my whole life, and I still wouldn't have a toaster. I wouldn't even get close. It's just too hard. The problem is too hard. I don't want to accuse Thomas Lazius, and he spent nine months over a thousand pounds and put all of this all of this different uh, equipment, uh, trying to make the toast, but this is, this is toast, by the way. <laughs> and so it would be unfair to accuse him of, of taking too many shortcuts, but he did have to take shortcuts. So nickel he got by buying on eBay commemorative Canadian dollars that are made of nickel. It's not that hard. Um, copper he obtained via electrolysis. Uh, electrolysis from a polluted copper mine in Anglesey. Um, plastic, plastic, we said that plastic's important. Where does plastic come from? Oil, yeah. Where does oil come from? BP, yeah. <laughs> they all it, they spill it everywhere. So, <laughs> so Thomas called BP and said, you know, I'm a design student, I'm trying to make a toaster, yeah, I've uh, got my own jug, and I was thinking maybe you could fly me out to an oil rig, and I'd get some crude oil. And I said, no, some kind of helicopter safety training or something. I don't know why they were so sensitive about the whole thing, but they, they said no. So then he tried to make plastic from potato starch, which you can do as long as you don't allow it to be eaten by hungry snails. Yeah, school boy error. Um, <laughs> In the end, he, he got his plastic from a, a plastic recycling facility. So, you know, he just basically asked for some plastic, but it was used plastic. So, you know, shortcut after shortcut after shortcut, but that's the thing. It's, a, it's an almost impossible task. I'm going to show you a picture of the toaster. So, a couple of weeks ago, it was my daughter's birthday, and she asked me, would I please uh, bake her a cake in the shape of a Dalmatian? <laughs> I did. I did. Good dad, me. Now imagine that instead of asking for a Dalmatian birthday cake, she had asked me for a toaster shaped birthday cake. <laughs> and imagine that I'd baked that for her, but that I had been paralytically drunk. <laughs> <laughs> probably asking yourselves is, does it make toast? <laughs> so I asked Thomas and he said, it, it warms bread <laughs> when I plug it into a car battery. <laughs> and I'm not sure what's going to happen when I plug it into the mains. But in the end, I mean, he had a whole, uh, he had a whole exhibition of this whole project. It's wonderful. He's got a book out. It's a toaster project. Um, 
And I think after the exhibition was closed, I'm not sure about the details, I think he had a couple of glasses of champagne with some friends, and they, they finally did plug it into the veins to see what would happen. And it immediately burst into flame. <laughs> Which rather wonderfully, Thomas says, it is a partial success. <laughs>
heroic failure. The toaster was an example of a brilliant art project. But the toaster itself uh, first appeared in the late 19th century. It was called the Eclipse. And it rusted, and it set fire to things, and it electrocuted people. And all of the companies that were initially involved in the toaster market got out of the toaster market. Many of them went bankrupt. And after about 40 years, somebody realized, you know what? You put the toast on the inside, then people wouldn't die. <laughs> you know, they got there in the end. And, and the, the toaster continues to evolve. It's not that complicated a problem. And yet, these things always evolve. There's always this process of trial and error. And that's true, clearly true in biological systems. Yeah. These amazingly complex biological objects have all evolved. Um, they've all developed over millions and millions of years through this Darwinian process of variation and selection. And of course, another word for variation and selection is trial and error. Try lots of things out, and then uh, some of them don't work. And uh, you know, all that natural selection. In other words, you know, a lot of stuff dies because the mutation was not very helpful. Um, but it, it also takes place in, um, this trial and error process takes place in non-biological systems. So to give you uh, an example of an industrial context, uh, Unilever. So I first heard about this story from Steve Jones, the geneticist. The Unilever, um, a while back, wanted to uh, create some cool, um, microgranule detergent thing. I don't really know why. I'm not that interested in soap. But so it was all, you know, all microgranules or microcapsules or something. And the way that they did this was to take a big vat of liquid detergent and spray it through a nozzle. And it forms into these little beads or these little flakes or whatever, and that's great. And you put it into a box and then you can sell it for lots of money at Tesco, and that's great. The, the thing is the design of the nozzle turned out to be incredibly important. And initially, um, Unilever did what you would expect to do in that circumstance, which is to say, well, get me the nozzle guy. I want the nozzle guy. I want the world's leading expert in nozzles. And I apologize for the gendered assumption that the world's leading expert in nozzles is a man. You know, that's, that's what with me. Uh, but anyway, regardless of the sex of the world's leading expert in, in nozzles, um, the world's leading expert in nozzles isn't expert enough to solve this problem. It's too hard. You don't really know what's going on inside the nozzle. And then some bright spark in Italy said, well, we could, of course, evolve the nozzle. And the way you evolve the nozzle is you, you take one, like it's big and it's plastic, and you create random variations. So you make it a bit narrower, or a bit wider, or a bit longer, or you put some bumps in it, some wrinkles, um, and it starts to look sort of, you know, more and more like some weird erotic object, and then after a while it starts to look like a chess piece turned on its side. And all the while you're testing this thing out, and you're taking the variants that work best, and you're using them as seeds for the next generation, and then the next generation, and you keep iterating, you keep trying new things, you keep creating these entirely random variations. And after about 20 generations, you've got this thing that works many, many times better than the original nozzle. And I'm reliably informed that Unilever have no idea how it works. Now, they, they don't need to know how it works. They just produce it through trial and error. Now, if I, if I can go back to this, um, this markets, subject again. We are the London School of Economics, but I should be talking about how markets work a bit. When markets work well, they are mechanisms for producing trial and error. So a uh, substantial percentage of companies go out of business one way or another, um, sometimes at a very high rate. So in America, the rate at which firms disappear, either being bought out or going bankrupt, is about 10% a year. That's a very high failure rate. And that's, that's not during recessions, that's, that's across good times and bad. So these, these ideas that are not working are being filtered out fairly aggressively. And at the same time, there's a constant supply of new ideas in business. And most of the new ideas, I mean, we, we have all this rhetoric about you know, the amazing creativity of the entrepreneur and the superior uh, mind of the businessman versus the politician. Um, but of course, most of these ideas are really bad ideas. 
Most of these business ideas don't work. And it's kind of natural that most of these ideas don't work because all the obvious good ideas have been tried. So the only thing that remains is ideas that seem to be not very good ones. But some of them are good nevertheless, so they're surprisingly good. So you've got this constant generation of ideas. Many of them don't work. Some of them do. And you've got this failure rate. So this is a process of variation and selection. This is a process of trial and error. And I think it's very important to emphasize that capitalist systems um, don't work despite corporate failure. They work because of corporate failure. There's a very interesting study by uh, Randall Walk, uh, a couple of co-authors. Um, and he, they, they have a measure of turnover in various major economies. Uh, and it turnover, by which I mean the, um, they look at the, the top 10 employers and they say, well, each year, how likely is it that there'll be, there'll be new companies in this list of top 10 employers? Or is it the same 10 companies every year? Uh, and in, in countries where the list of top 10 employers keeps changing, that's a good predictor of future economic growth. Uh, and it's just a, it's a statistical indicator, but I think it's a very important point that this process of corporate failure is how new ideas are brought to the surface. It goes right back to Schumpeter and creative destruction. Now, I don't want to suggest that, and therefore, markets for everyone, um, <coughs> that all we really needed in Iraq was just sort of four or five different competing private armies, and we were pretty soon have figured out how to solve that problem. Um, I, I don't want to make that case. What I do want to make, uh, the case I do want to make is to say, we underrate the importance of experimentation and failure in market systems. We overrate business insight. We overrate the profit motive. The profit motive is important, business insight is important. But we underrate this sheer blind luck, this sheer experimental process. And we often miss opportunities within large organizations, within hierarchies such as armies, within governments, sometimes even within our own lives. We miss opportunities to copy this fundamental process of experimentation. So um, this is why I emphasize the fact that what Twyla Tharp did, that risking this terrible mistake, was so fundamentally important. Because if you don't risk making a mistake, you're not going to solve any problems at all. I, I used to work at the World Bank, and uh, uh, my boss there once said, it was an unusual boss, he was, he was German and told very funny jokes. So he's unusual in a number of ways. <laughs> um, I apologize to all the Germans in the audience. Um, he, uh, yeah, he used to say, jokes are no laughing matter in Germany. Um, <laughs> one of the other things, he, one of the other things he, he did, apart from tell funny jokes, was um, he, he said that the World Bank's failure rate uh, is disturbingly low. Disturbingly low. Um, failure rate seems to be about 10%. And the ultimate failure rate of a private sector project is probably about 50%. And the bank is supposed to be doing business in very, very difficult environments. So either what we define as failure uh, is an extremely restrictive definition of failure. And there are lots of things that have failed, but we just won't own up to them. Either that, or we're being incredibly conservative. We aren't taking nearly enough risks. We aren't exploiting nearly enough opportunities to do good for fear that some of them won't work out. So experimentation is important. The risk of error is important. Um, so I could sort of say, well, okay, and therefore yeah, privatize everything, markets for everything. Clearly that doesn't always work. Clearly there are situations where um, that, that's not going to be possible. It's either not going to be politically feasible, or it's just not possible at all for, for various reasons. So if, we, if we're in a situation where we can't expect this competitive process to do the experimentation for us, or well, we can still experiment. There are all kinds of ways in which we can experiment. But there are also some very powerful organizational, political, and psychological barriers to doing that. So I want to take a little bit of time to talk about those. And um, one of the things I'm going to have to do is uh, switch, oh gosh, this is all attached to is switch to this. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? But they sneakily, they've moved it along. 
by 17 seconds. <laughs> they, they, want, they want me to fail. Rise of the then we'll succeed. Okay, we're going to give this a try. I'm hoping the sound is on. Uh, we'll see. I'll do an amusing improvised voiceover if the sound is on. <laughs> well, I'll do an improvised voiceover. I don't want to do it. So, um, get on with it, Tim. <laughs> I want to talk about one of these barriers to experimentation. And a very important figure in this is the psychologist uh, Solomon Ash. And of course, being an economist, I can't talk about anything that's happened in psychology for at least 40 years. It's going to be a really old psychologist. Um, and I'm, I'm going to tell you about Solomon Ash's work. And, um, but before I do, I discovered, recently discovered something completely brilliant, which is that exactly 50 years ago, Solomon Ash. Um, was a consultant to uh, Candid Camera. And they made, a, they made a short film. So I'm going to show you the film. It's two minutes long, and then I'll tell you about Solomon Ash. The gentleman in the elevator now is a Candid star. He spoke to Sir Henry, the man with the white shirt, but he was a trench coat. And subsequently, one other member of our staff will face the ring. And you'll see how this man in the dress is to maintain his individuality. He's <laughs> 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 his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit. <laughs> And uh, this man has apparently been in the Person. 
Although the answer is clearly B, everybody else has said A. And that last person would very often say A. Now, of course, having seen the kind of camera movie, you know exactly what's going on. All of these people, except the last guy, are actors working for Solomon Ash. So, he was really interested in the fact that you could get people to say something that was clearly not true, simply by showing them that everybody else seems to believe it. Now, this is a really important problem, especially when you're talking about vaguer, more difficult, more complex challenges. If you're sitting in a, uh, a cabinet meeting, as I'm sure some of you will one day, if you're sitting in a boardroom, sitting anywhere where a group of people are making a decision, it's very difficult to be the one person who sticks his hand up or her hand up and says, actually, I think our current policy, our current strategy, our current tactics are wrong. I think we, or, or I think they might be wrong. I think we should try something else. I think we should experiment. I think we should risk screwing up. Let's do something different. Even if it's only you know, around the edges, even if it's only a new pilot, even if it's only a, a product mock-up or, or a little experiment, it's very difficult to be the person who sticks out when the pressure of conformity is so great. So Solomon Ash tweaked this experiment. And another way he ran it, again, the answer is B. We go through A, 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 B. A, 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 A. We get to the person at the end of the line. And now we discover it's not a popularity contest. The person at the end of the line is not interested in being in the majority. They just don't want to be by themselves. And very often, with only one person saying B, with only one person giving the correct answer, the person at the end of the line, the person who's actually being experimented on, would be willing to say B. That's all it took to break the spell of conformity. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, Solomon Ash went, went even further, so he did a, 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 another follow-up. And in this case, he went along the line, and again, the answer B. A, 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 C. A, 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 A. Now he gets to the end of the line. Nobody has said the right answer. But somebody has said a different wrong answer. <laughs> and it turns out that that's often all it takes to get the last person, the person at the end of the line, to, to speak out and to say what they believe to be true. And in fact, there's a very interesting follow-up experiment by um, psychologist uh, Bernard Levine. So, uh, his follow-up experiment is a bit different. It doesn't, it doesn't involve lines and so on. The same basic idea is there. But before the experiment takes place, the actual victim of the experiment, as opposed to you know, all these actors, the actual person who's being experimented on is in a room filling in a consent form. And somebody walks in with these pair of incredibly thick glasses. They're so thick they look as though they've been specially made out of milk bottle bottles. <laughs> they have actually made out of the He doesn't know that. And the person with these comically thick glasses then bumps into him or her and says, oh, I'm really sorry, um, my eyesight's incredibly bad. Oh gosh, do we have to fill in a form? Could you please fill in this form for me? I can't really see. So now the experimental victim is filling in this form for, for Mr. Magoo. Next him. Can't see him. Just looking through the inch thick glasses. And then the experimenter comes in. And the, the person with the glasses puts his hand up or her hand up and says, excuse me, sir, is this a task that requires visual perception? Because I'm afraid my eyesight is really very poor. And the experimenter, this is all in front of the person who's actually going to be experimented on. The experimenter says, um, yeah, yeah, I'm afraid actually it is a task requiring visual perception. But we need 10 people to participate for it to be valid, and you're one of the 10 people. So I'm afraid you will have to participate, please. And although you can't see, just say something at random. A, 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 A. The person who cannot see anything 
and has been ordered to speak at random. C. A, 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 A. We get to the person at the end of the line. What do they say? B. All it takes. They have permission to tell the truth. That's all it takes. So if you are ever in a room where it occurs to you that maybe everybody might be making a mistake, that maybe uh, you, know, you should speak out and suggest a different course of action, you should do so for two reasons. And one is, if you even find yourself remotely tempted to do this, it's probably a good idea because the psychological obstacles to doing so are huge. So if you can bring yourself to do so, it, probably your idea is a very good one. Probably it deserves to be heard. There's a second reason, which is that even if your idea is terrible, there might be somebody else in the room who does have a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's not until you say something that that person is going to have the courage to speak out. In fact, if, you, if all you do for the rest of your life is go to meetings, you say stupid. You may well justify your existence. <laughs> I said I'd talk about different psychological barriers to experimentation. So that's one of them. In any big organisation, it's hard to break that spell of conformity. Uh, well, I mean, it doesn't take a lot, but to be that person who does it, um, that can be really difficult. So let me give you a second obstacle. And I mentioned earlier that I, I work for the World Bank. Well, back in the day when I worked for the World Bank, about eight years ago, one of the things that um, was really cool at the time, everyone was excited about it, you know, all the rock stars were excited about it. Laura Bush was excited about it. She's not a rock star, but, you know. Uh, one of these ideas was, was something called the play pump. And the play pump is uh, a, a children's merry-go-round. But what you do is you, you go to a village where they have a, a borehole to access clean water. And you take out the hand pump that they've been using, and you replace it with this merry-go-round. You also install a raised storage tank. And the storage tank has corporate advertising on it, so the whole thing is paid for by, by advertising, so it's free. And what happens is the children are delighted to have this play equipment, and you're often talking about very poor communities that don't have this kind of stuff. So they play on the merry-go-round, and as they play on the merry-go-round, that pumps water, and the water goes into the storage tank. And then when the women in the village come to collect the water, because it always is the women in the village, Instead of having to pump with this hand pump, pump their own water, they just go to the storage tank and just turn on the tap. It's brilliant. So we were very excited about this kind of thing. And initially, it was rolled out in um, townships in South Africa. And it seems to be going pretty well. The interesting thing about townships in South Africa, we now realize, is they have a very high population density. There are lots of children <coughs> to play on these merry-go-rounds and to pump with water. And there are lots of grown-ups to see the adverts, so the advertising will be willing to pay. Now, when the idea came to maybe install this kind of thing in, say, Malawi, and Malawi's much lower population density, you're going to put this in a village in Malawi. No advertiser is going to pay for it. That's okay. The world is full of uh, very generous people, um, people who donate money directly, also governments who tax their citizens and, and donate money, um, who are all willing to pay for this kind of thing. So you use donor money, and you install this thing. And who's going to argue when you rip out the hand pump and you install the play pump? This, sort of this, you know, this just donor helicopter thing comes in and does it. The question is, how do you discover whether it's a good idea? What you do is you send a photographer, so especially if it's privately donated, because you want to take photographs of all the cute little kids from Malawi playing on the merry go round You can show them to your dad and say, look at this wonderful thing that you, you made possible. So the photographer shows up with this gigantic camera, and nobody's on the merry go round But all the little kids see the man with the camera, and they all jump on the merry go round and they go round and round and round. It's a big smile, they're so happy. And the photographer takes these great you know, motion learned pictures of all these children playing on the merry go round and sends the, the photographs back to the donors. The trouble is, mostly, there aren't any children playing on the merry go round. There just aren't that many children. And so what happens is, when the women of the village 
comes to pump water. <laughs> You've got two problems. One is a hand pump's actually pretty efficient. So you try doing it with a merry-go-round, it's not that easy. <laughs> and the second problem is the whole thing is being pumped, because it's supposed to take place on a time delay, it's being pumped up into this big tank and then immediately down again because you're pumping the water that you're using right, right now. So this makes it much less efficient. How are the donors going to find out? It was worth a try. It was an experiment. It was a risk of failure. It was worth doing. It did fail. It was a bad idea. How do you then find out it was a bad idea? The feedback loop is completely broken. And in fact, we only figured out that this was a bad plan. <coughs> At least it was bad in somewhere like rural Malawi. Because a Canadian engineer called Owen Scott arrived in Malawi, he was working for Engineers Without Borders. And he could immediately see what the problem was, because he was right there. And he had a, a video camera, and a phone, and a blog, and access to social media. So he did various stunts, like he would, um, he would do these demonstrations where you get a hand pump and a play pump, and you're you know, you'd have, you'd have some local woman just pumping water and take about 25 seconds to fill a bucket. And then you'd have Owen on video just going around and around and around, <laughs> minutes after minutes after minute, looking like a complete idiot, <laughs> failing to pump water. Or interviews with local teachers saying, please, stop sending the play pumps. They are causing real trouble for the lab. Please stop. And that was the moment when the donors realized, hmm, could be time for a course correction. So in the end, I, I, I'd say that's, that's a success story. But feedback loops are extremely important. If you're going to experiment, you need to know whether your experiment is working. And it can be really difficult to do this. It's particularly difficult in the aid industry, because there's such a long chain between the person who's giving the money and the person who's receiving the stuff at the end of it. But it's not just the aid industry, the army. The, the private, it's the private that it's not the general that the strategy screwed up. The one general I interviewed for the book said, well, actually, we learn from our mistakes really quickly on the ground because if you make mistakes, people die. So you learn very fast. It's just the upper echelons of the army don't learn nearly as quickly. The stakes aren't so high, the feedback loops aren't there. Um, in medicine, we've invented this tremendous. Uh, set of institutions around randomized trials, um, double-blind randomized trials, trial registers, <coughs> peer review. It, and it, it's still imperfect. But it's better than nothing. And we need all this stuff because it's so easy to fool yourself that your experiment was a success when in fact it was a failure. And, and the, the easiest way, the easiest thing of all is just to say, well, here's a problem. I will implement my favorite policy Oh, look, the problem got better. Well, you know, all problems do get better. It's called, called uh, regression to the mean. Um, lots of problems fix themselves. Doesn't mean that it was your policy. If you didn't do a proper trial, you don't know. So these feedback loops are incredibly important, and that's a, that's a second obstacle to successful experimentation. Uh, third obstacle is what happens when everything happens all too quickly when you get chain reactions, when systems spiral out of control, when it's, it's all happening too fast to fix your mistakes. A nuclear power station or a, a financial system. Now, I talked about this at great length in a lecture at the LSE about a year and a half ago. So I'm not going to say anything about it. Look at the old lecture. It's great. It's not that funny. Everybody dies in the lecture. Well, not the audience, but it's very bad things happen. Um, but that's a, that's a third obstacle that needs to be recognized. Uh, I talk about it in the lecture, I talk about it in the book. And the fourth obstacle, and this is the, the last one I want to talk about, the fourth obstacle is just, it, it, it's us. It's our willingness to take these risks, and our willingness to respond sensibly when the risks don't pay off. But one of the earliest findings in behavioral economics, was, which, as I'm sure you all know, is this sort of the bastard love child of economics and psychology. Um, one of the earliest findings in behavioral economics is this thing called loss aversion. And uh, loss aversion is a disproportionate anxiety about what might actually be quite small losses. And very often, uh, you will see people doing stupid things to try to turn a small loss into not a loss at all. And of course, that might well turn a small loss into a very big loss. Now, in researching the book, I 
I, I really tried to leave no stone unturned. And this, this is how far I went. I, I went to the studios of Deal or No Deal, and I interviewed no members. <laughs> well, it takes some time. <laughs> bad economics. Um, and the reason Deal or No Deal is interesting is because it's a game show where people make high stakes decisions uh, under conditions of risk. And because it's an internationally syndicated game show, and because it, it's completely interminable, and the rules are always basically the same, you can study how people play in this game show. And you can get statistically robust conclusions out of this kind of study. So uh, Steve Levitt, um, famous, the free economics guy, famously studied The Weakest Link. Uh, Richard Fowler, the co-author of Nudge, studied Deal No Deal. Now, obviously you're students, so you don't you know, watch daytime television, right? <laughs> so just to, uh, some of you may not be students. So um, just to be clear, about the rules of deal or no deal, because I'm assuming nobody has watched it. Um, the way it works, it varies a little from place to place, but the, the basic way it works is you've got a bunch of boxes, maybe 22, 24 boxes, and each box has some cash in it. And the amount of cash uh, it varies a lot and it's highly skewed. So most of the boxes have you know, 10 pounds, 25 pounds, 50 pounds, 100 pounds, maybe pennies, maybe a maybe thousand pounds or 2,000 pounds, but, but not, not huge, not life-changing sums of money. And then a few boxes have 25,000 pounds, 50,000 pounds, 100,000 pounds, 250,000 pounds, real chunks of cash. And the player has one of these boxes and has no idea which of these sums of money is in the box. And she will, over time, choose other boxes, and those boxes will be opened and discarded. So if she chooses a box that's got £250,000 in, that's really bad news, because it means her box does not have £250,000 in. If she chooses a box and it's got 10 pence in, that's really good news, because it means her box does not have 10 pence in. So you know, players play this game, and we draw conclusions about how we respond to risks and how we respond to losses. My favourite player of Deal or No Deal of all time is a guy called Frank. And he was a player in the original Dutch version of the game. And he played for a bit, and he had five boxes left. One of them had the jackpot, which is half a million euros in the Dutch version. And the others had not a lot. The banker phoned, oh, I forgot to tell you about the banker. So brilliantly, Really, Deal or No Deal, before the financial crisis, Deal or No Deal invented this character called the bank, who was a complete arts. I was very forward thinking. Um, so the bank will call on the Baker Light telephone and will say, uh, we'll say, I will offer you money to stop playing. Effectively, I'll, I'll offer you money for whatever's in your box. The banker doesn't know what's in your box, you don't know what's in your box. But the bank will make the offer and you have to decide. And that's why the, the game is called Deal or No Deal. So the banker calls Frank. Frank's got four boxes of not a lot and one box of half a million euros. So you could do the maths. The expected value of the game is more than 100,000 euros, but maybe not that much more. The banker offers Frank 85,000 euros to stop. And Frank thinks about it. And Frank decides he's feeling lucky. And he says no. That's fine. That's, that's a bit of a, you know, he's not very risk averse, clearly, Frank. Not very risk averse, but that's, it's not a wrong decision. At least, you know, not at the time. With hindsight, it's a bit different. Because the next box that Frank opened contained 500,000 euros. So the bank phones Frank back. And says, thanks for paying that. <laughs> My new offer is two and a half thousand euros. Now Frank had been thinking completely rationally about this. He was said to himself, there's actually really not a lot in the four remaining boxes. Two and a half thousand euros is a pretty decent deal. Objectively speaking, it's a better deal relative to the value of continuing to play the game. It's a better deal than the 85,000 euros was. 
But that's not what Frank's thinking. Frank's thinking two things. Frank's thinking, I hate a banker. <laughs> <laughs> and Frank's also thinking, I hate myself. I hate myself. It's a stupid decision I made. And he's, he's lost it. He's no longer able to rationally evaluate what he should do now, having made this mistake. He tried something, it didn't work. What does he do now? He's just seeing red. And we see the same behavior. This has been studied in poker players. Same thing in poker players. This has been studied in stock market investors. Same thing in stock market investors. The same behavior you see in, in, in anybody in an institution, a manager with a new product line, a politician with a new policy, uh, and it's failing, and it's failing so they're just going to push it harder and throw more weight behind it and more money behind it. And uh, obviously, nobody has ever had a relationship like this, but you know, I raise it as a theoretical risk that that might also happen. That in refusing to acknowledge that it's failed, you just redouble the pain. So Frank says no. And he says no, he says no, and eventually he has just two boxes. One has 10 euros and one has 10,000 euros. And the banker offers him 6,000 euros to please stop. <laughs> and Frank says no. <laughs> Frank leaves the game, 10 euros. And it turns out, according to Richard Thaler's statistical analysis, Frank's behavior is actually pretty typical. This is how people re react when they made a call, they turned down a deal, and they opened a big value box, and the bank was off and fell. Suddenly, they get very aggressive, very misloving, very stupid. And that's a real challenge. It's a challenge to my view of how we should solve problems. Because if, if we go off the rails every time we make a mistake, this trial and error process isn't going to work. So that those, those are the four obstacles I have. I wanted to consider. Conformity, the lack of willingness to try something new. Feedback, lack of information about whether something's actually working or not. Certain systems where experimentation is very dangerous, like the financial system. And our own inability to act rationally immediately after taking a loss. But we still have to do it. We still have to do it, because there is no other way to solve problems in a complex world other than to experiment. So we've got to get over these four barriers, one way or another. We've got to demand that our politicians get over them, our business leaders get over them, and we've got to get over them ourselves. I told you I was going to come back to Tyler Farr. So the morning after the show, Tyler sat down with Jennifer Tipton, who's a very old friend, lighting designer. And they sat with all of the reviews Orange juice, coffee. And Jennifer gestured at the reviews. And she looked Tyler right in the eye. And she said, you know they're right. It's a very difficult thing to say to a friend. Everybody who says what you created is terrible, they're right. And it's also a very difficult thing to be the person who asks for that direct feedback. We don't usually ask for feedback. We usually ask for a pat on the back. We usually ask for reassurance. We don't actually ask for somebody to, to tell us what it is that we've done wrong and what it is that needs fixing. And having got that absolutely clear feedback, Tyler then tried to, to suck the emotion out of the situation so, and really analyze what had gone wrong. And she asked another friend to go through all the reviews and just objectively pick out the points of criticism, to put them all on the spreadsheet. Specifically, what is it that people are worried about? Why don't they like this, this musical? What's the problem? And where do people agree? Where, where do all the critics say there's a problem? Because that's clearly what I've got to fix. And she then had to go back to her investors who were asking where's their $8 million going. She had to go back to her musicians and say, you know, I put you in the middle of the stage. It's visually cluttered, it's confusing. You're going to be off stage, no one's going to see you. Yeah, you'll love that. <laughs> she had to go to some of her dancers and say, you know that role that I scripted for you? It's too complicated. You're sacked. You're not going to be in the show. 
it's not your fault, it's my fault, sorry, bye. And then to get her other dancers to, to, work, on, to work on new dances, to work on new moves, new plots. All the while performing in Chicago on the stage every night is this show that everyone hates, these dwindling audiences, and then to get up early in the morning and then rehearse this completely different show. It's incredibly difficult to keep all that together, to keep that on the road. Just a few weeks later, moving out, open for years, and it won a Tony Award for Tyler Tharp's choreography. And my favorite review was written by the Chicago reviewer who first penned that re real stinker that was syndicated in New York. He'd actually been flown down by the New York press to write an updated version. And he wrote this review and he said, it's amazing. Uh, it, it, it's unprecedented to see such a terrible show that turned into such a good one. And while praising the show, he also raised a question which I think really sticks with me. He just wrote, how did this happen? How did this happen? And that, to me, is one of the most important questions of all. Because if we want to do anything important, if we want to solve any important problems, it's going to involve this process of risking, making, risking mistakes and making mistakes and then fixing our mistakes. And if we don't show an interest in how mistakes are corrected, we don't really show interest in solving problems at all. Thanks very much for listening. Space is, it depends on how much is known. Um, I mean, all I would say is that you, you're in a very bad situation if all you can do is create purely random mutations. Even Unilever, they knew they had to have a nozzle. They didn't start with a you know, block, a cube or something with no hole in it and try and evolve from there. They knew they had to, they were, they were what they're basically trying to do. So where you start and which directions you take your experiments, I think, will be informed by expertise. But I just constantly caution that we, we tend to overrate expertise. And that's why I'm pushing this idea of experimentation so hard. So just to give you two very, very quick examples. If you look at um, the patterns of corporate failure, Paul Ormerod, in his book, Why Most Things Fail, it's a wonderful book, um, shows that you can, you, there, are, there are mathematical models that will, will duplicate the, the power law distribution of um, of extinctions, biological extinctions, which we know are, we know that's a blind process, okay? We know there's no use of saying you know, what gets extinct now and what doesn't. Um, so the question is, well, do we see a similar process in um, corporate extinctions? Uh, well, we don't know about the process, but we know that the, the distribution is the same. We've got the same parallel distribution. And then when you try and tweak models, so you've got this, these, these mathematical models that are very blind and completely unguided, completely random. And you tweak them and try and say, well, you know, what if, you, what, what if there was some role for expertise, you know, about Steve Jobs and so on. 
and, and you, you, you try to tweak them. Um, you can do that, that's fine, but you get uh, mathematical outcomes that don't look anything like reality. Now, I mean, I don't mean to say that's a knockdown argument that expertise is useless, but it's a, it, it sort of creates uh, food for thought. And to, to come with a, a specific example, um, I, I studied the counterinsurgency process, the surge in Iraq, in the book. And some of the people who were involved in that said, well, look, you know, it wasn't an experimental thing. Um, you know, we knew what to do. It was just a case of finally the top brass getting around to doing it. But that doesn't really add up. There were very, very impressive people with tremendously deep local expertise. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of General Abizaid, very important uh, guy in uh, the prosecution of the war in Iraq. He didn't think it was a good idea, but he was, he was in charge early on once it actually happened. Um, and his strategy was completely different to the strategy that eventually worked. And I think from the point of view of a layman, you'd be hard put to say, well, Abizaid clearly didn't know what he was talking about. He was expert, there were other experts, they disagreed. The only way to, to actually figure out what worked was this extremely tragic and very bloody process of experimentation. Got a good question? Michael Pons, uh, Jishi Press, thank you very much. Um, I guess from your sort of thesis, you perhaps say that we're imperfect and we have to keep um, experimenting to get ahead in uh, knowledge. Um, one of my sort of intellectual heroes is Leszek Kolakowski, the Polish philosopher, and his magisterial three body main currents of Marxism, where he takes on uh, Marxism. And um, he comes to the conclusion that a fundamental problem with socialism is that there's this idea of this or communism with this perfect man, that society is permanently mailable. And then in the collection of in 1990 for Modernity and Endless Trial, he goes into the Enlightenment and he goes into critiquing maybe, maybe the sort of postmodernism where he says that in a kind of socialist or even liberal sort of technocratic central um, planning, um, you know, we've got all the um, information, but from your suggestion, we have systematic failures, and you just said the experts don't always know any, anything which perhaps maybe goes against a kind of technocratic, expert-like thing. But yet, we're not perfect. We do live, uh, we, we will always live in a floor world, but then we need to experiment how we, you know, in order to get somewhere. So my question to you is, um, I know it's a very, very big one, but we need, to ex we need to experiment to get ahead and progress, knowing the fact that you know, we're not perfect, we're not going to get ahead on Earth. But then you talked about the utility of cost. I mean, if we make mistakes all the time, um, you know, we've got, you know, it's a real problem. So we need to experiment, but then perhaps maybe you can experiment too much. And, and Kolakowski brings up this point about... Um, about I'm, I'm of, conscious that there are other people with questions. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'll uh, try to make it. Well, I think the question is very simple. I wonder if your example about Twilight of Thought was really very accurate. Because while she was rehearsing in her mind and with the uh, actors some completely new solution or system, the real system was being enacted every night in Chicago and coming to a terrible failure. Now, this is the kind of thing we can't do for real. If we are in the middle of such a failure, we cannot say, well, we'll shut it down at a certain point, and by then we'll work to the real one. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is live with the real one. And I wonder if your example has really shown us how to deal with it. Yeah. <coughs> uh, so going back to toasters, um, I'm a bit nervous because you mentioned that all the corporates involved in development went past. So therefore, what incentive is there for a rational business? to risk its research and development budget on taking random experiments. I think there are probably externalities involved, and I wondered if you saw the role of the government in helping to subsidise R&D. Yeah, okay. Um, thank, thank you very much, all, all great questions. Um, so, uh, on, on the question of, of, of whether it's worth it, and it's actually sort of, uh, these two questions are slightly tied together, so um, there, is a, there is a risk that on an individual basis it's not worth it. Um, to experiment because there's a huge, there, there are huge externalities, um, and I think there is sometimes a very important role for government. 
And the interesting thing, so let's think about what the role of the government is. So one of the things you might want to do is um, limit the way, uh, limit the downside risk to an entrepreneur who starts a business and then it fails. So you might, you might want to have some sort of limited liability company. Oh, we've well, we got that. That's good. That's very important. Um, you might want to have a welfare state to support people who, you know, in between their experiments. Well, we've got that. That's important. Um, there are other, uh, I mean, there are a number of implicit R&D subsidies, for instance, the existence of the university system, which is great. Uh, I think I'm safe in saying that here. Um, obviously, she should be much, much more, more money for uh, the university. Um, uh, um, I mean, one, can get, one can get more specific as well about, about the kinds of subsidies you would give to, to innovation. Um, and I, I discussed this in some detail in um, chapter two, I think, of the book. And there are some interesting ways in which you could do it. There are systems of grants. Um, the patent system, I think, is quite flawed. I wouldn't want it scrapped, but I think it needs radical reform. Uh, we, we could use innovation prizes as well, which we're not, we're not really doing seriously at the moment. Uh, and we could, and I think that would be very helpful. Um, I mean, to, to, to go back to this question in general about how much should we experiment, um, it depends on the downside risk and the upside risk. I want uh, Google to experiment a lot more than I want Ford to experiment. You know, I don't want Ford to be releasing cars and saying, well, the brakes don't work, we'll fix it in, in you know, the alpha, in, in the, sort of the beta release, or you know, the we'll patch it. Um, so a lot depends on the kind of system you have. Um, uh, and th th then this comes to this gentleman's question here. I think this is really important. So you've always got to be willing to fix mistakes, but clearly there's no point in saying, well, we're just not going to fix this mistake because, because we're not. I went off on people, well, that wasn't what you said, I know. So clearly you want to fix mistakes. But then the question is, well, at what point, given the mistakes are inevitable, because they are, where, where do you want to make them? Now, Tyler Tharp comments herself, she said, the best mistakes you can make are private mistakes. So she, in, in, the, in the privacy of your own room, no one's watching. That's the best kind of mistake you can make. She gets up every morning at 5.30, rehearses for three hours with a, with a younger dancer. She's now about 70. She used to do it by herself. Um, and they videotape everything. And they do this thing they, she calls scratching. So you say improvising, just looking for different rooms. She said, if you've got 30 seconds of successful material out of three hours of improvisation, you're ahead, okay, because the cost of failure is very low, and the benefits of that 30 seconds is very high. Clearly, by the time you're on stage in Chicago, you've left a little bit late. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right to suggest maybe she should have got better advice earlier. Maybe she should have fixed the problem earlier. But you know, it's never too late to fix the problem, but you can make it much earlier. Run a, run a small controlled trial, run a pilot, you're clearly going to be in a, in a much better situation. <coughs> Hi, uh, Jim Morgan, I'm a government scientist. Um, my question is, do we need to change the way we educate people at a lower level or in university to enable us to take this approach? And is it just confined to a Western mindset, or is it kind of global? Um, Richard Goldstein, um, two things. Uh, when society becomes more and more complex, and, every, and you start interacting with everything else, the probability that the mutation will be deleterious increases. You know, because you have a much rougher fitness landscape or such. So it's soon that as society becomes complicated, the ability to innovate um, randomly would decrease. The other thing is that as society becomes more complicated, it becomes harder to estimate risks. So someone comes up with an idea of why don't we have micro-trading on the stock exchange without being able to, um, to determine exactly what the risks could be, or even order of magnitude. So the question is, as society becomes more complicated and, and these interactions grow, how do we deal with these two issues? Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, certainly the uh, conformity and um, this conversion do come in the way of, of creativity. But you're not going to me that uh, 
there is no difference between a person who is 99% times failure and the one who is only 5% times failure. There is a difference. And what is it at Stubborn District that, that explains that difference? Uh, I suspect it is our ability to solve problems, and uh, I think it is our ability to think, really, which determines that how successful we are, how, how often we are successful. So I think when you are looking for, um, I'm sorry, but I must say this, <coughs> when you are looking to improve our problem solving ability, I think what we need to do is improve our thinking ability. And uh, I think I should look at somebody should try and see how can we improve our thinking ability. And can you suggest anything that will help to improve our thinking ability? Thank you. Thank you very much. So actually, the, 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 the third question and the first question are, are connected because this is, I think, about the education system. I'm very interested in um, the research of Carol Dweck. So she's, a, she, she's a psychologist, and she's done quite a bit of work on um, uh, getting people to risk failure, encouraging people to risk failure, and encouraging people to consider the possibility of improvement. So she's got this idea of the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset. It's one of her most famous experiments where she's got a bunch of kids to solve some problems. And half of them were told, this is totally random, half of them were told, oh, you, you, you did very well, you must be very smart. And the other half were told, oh, you, you did very well, you must have worked very hard. Um, and there's a, there's a huge, and, and then they were given different, more difficult problems. And the ones who were told, oh, you did very well, you must have worked very hard, uh, were much happier to engage with these harder problems. It was like, well, these are, these are problems are harder, therefore I must work harder, uh, I must be afraid of them. Um, so I think there's a sort of failure, acceptance of the risk of failure. The kids who were told, you must be very smart, uh, when they encountered problems that they couldn't solve, seemed to draw the conclusion that they, they must therefore be very stupid. And they stopped trying, they stopped trying, they withdrew from these problems. And then later, so it works, and then later when they were told afterwards, would you like another book of these problems to take home? The kids who'd been praised for their hard work um, were, were very happy to take, the, take these home. So, uh, I mean, there's, there's so much in Greg's work, and I'm, I'm oversimplifying it. But I think it, it's very important to be teaching children not only be smart, not only go out there and find the right answer, but also there is the possibility of growth. Try this stuff. If you try stuff you can't do, uh, that's the only way that you will learn to do it. If you always constantly avoid stuff that you can't do, you, know, you are never going to improve uh, your understanding. You're never going to improve your thinking. Uh, so that's very important. It's slightly unfortunate that, I think quite naturally in our education system, we have a situation where there are right answers and there's a person in the corner of the room who has a list of the right answers and an authority figure. And it's, it's natural. I don't want to criticize and say, well, you know, we should teach you know, everybody that maths is all relative, man. And, you know, <laughs> that. But I think, I think it is a little unfortunate because it's a very poor proxy for many real world problems where there are no obvious right answers and there's certainly no authority figure who knows the answers. So we need to be careful about that. And as for the Eastern versus Western mindset, I'm very cautious about generalizing, but I've been told by a number of people that um, Oriental cultures are uh, risk averse, they're afraid of failure. I do remember seeing some of direct research saying Japanese kids are far happier to stand at the blackboard for 40 minutes failing to solve a maths problem while their classmates offer helpful suggestions and they all try and figure it out together. So uh, I, I haven't studied closely the, the cultural elements, but I'm, I'm wary of, uh, sort of uh, broad brush conclusions. Gentlemen at the back, it probably should be our last question, shouldn't it? Um, so I see, see people, these are potential book buyers are leaving the hall. Um, <laughs> Without yeah, no, it's not allowed. Okay, I'll pass. Um, I, think, I, think, I think this is a very important point, and this is particularly relevant to, not only relevant to, but particularly relevant to our financial system. And when I discuss how we regulate the financial system, I think the key thing that we have to bear in mind is um, by the time the financial innovation is out there in the wild, it's potentially too late because all these institutions are far too interconnected, far too big to fail, far too fragile. 
uh, and we should be learning lessons from engineering and from the psychology of organizational behavior, the, the guys who basically stop nuclear power stations blowing up and stop oil rigs blowing up, who I talked to at some length for the book, and they're very interested in simplifying systems for their own sake, decoupling systems for their own sake, and sometimes that is appropriate, even if from a purely technocratic point of view, we say, well, I don't, I don't see why it's helpful to make this simpler. I don't see why it's helpful to separate out these two businesses. Sometimes it just is. And an engineer would instinctively make that judgment call where an accountant, lawyer, economist in financial regulation might not quite see the point. Anything more? This gentleman's been very keen. Yes. We keep him for last. <laughs> it's my privilege to meet you. Um, I'm trying to summarize what you said um, from the beginning. You're saying that Toaston refers to the problems that are too hard to solve. And expertise are sometimes um, not that work is only experiment by trial and error. And here comes a question by um, economics is not like natural science where you can see the direct result of your get. Sometimes experiments being carried out, but there is no obvious failure. Like the 2008 financial crisis, in my understanding, at the, at the start, the, the banks think it works really well of putting all the risks interconnected with each other. Yeah. And so that's the thing, it's a success rather than a failure. And at last, a large, a larger scale came out. So that's my first question. And the second question is for, even if experiment carried out, we can't avoid system, systematic failure. Um, the financial crisis being like every 50 years, every 20 years of being um, restarted again. Yeah. So it's already not being averted. As, um, another point to mention is that... <laughs> I heard yeah. that the thing so is... I, I, feel yeah. two, I feel two questions is enough. Yeah. Yeah. Thank I you, sorry. Like, I'm just like emphasizing <laughs> Because some are saying, oh, Especially okay. if the third question is yeah. to emphasize the first two questions. Uh, <laughs> 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 so, can I try because they're yes. really good questions. Yes. So, can I try and address this? Yes. I, think, I think, thank you. Um, I think the, the second question is very similar to what this gentleman asked about the, about the systemic risk. Um, it's absolutely an issue. I don't think that the solution to systemic risk is to say, and therefore we must design a perfect system. Yeah, I mean, the fact that errors can be very, very dangerous, the fact that errors can have systemic consequences, recognizing that doesn't make the errors go away. So we just need to be much more clever about recognizing that these, these mistakes are inevitable. How do we detect them really early? I talk, for instance, I talk in the book about whistleblowers, the importance of whistleblowers in detecting early errors, or creating robust structures so that when the error, the error happens, it can be contained. Um, and as for your first point, yeah, this is social science, it's really tough. We don't always know whether an experiment has succeeded. It could be decades before we find out whether an experiment has succeeded. Um, we are trying, I mean, in this respect, it's similar to medicine. I mean, there are, there are medical procedures we've been doing for decades and then suddenly go, oops, we've been killing hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, if only we'd done a more robust experiment earlier. Um, so that's the point I was making about the feedback loops. It, it's absolutely a difficulty. Um, but, you know, we can't just shrug our shoulders and say, and therefore, we shouldn't experiment. Uh, because the alternative, which is some central committee, as this gentleman at the back was talking about, just trying to figure it all out from first principles, it, it, it won't ever work, it never has worked in the past. Um, so, I, I hope that you've tolerated my uh, attempts to experiment uh, and potentially risk failure. Um, I, I've had a lot of fun, and um, thank you for the very smart questions. Some of the people who didn't get to ask a question, or who didn't get to ask their third question, or <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, part of their question, but um, it's been terrific. Thank you very much for listening.